Welcome, and thanks for joining us in HPC Tech Talk today. I'm Tony Ray, and I'll be your host today for this episode. So today we're going to talk about a subject that's, you know, very, I've always wondered about, and you probably thought about this too, and that is, you know, what is the future of high performance computing? I mean, where is it? Where is it now? Where is it going to go? Is there a future for it? Or is it going to be the same old, same old going on forever? I don't think so. So to do that, I figured I'd ask uh, a special guest here today to help us get insights into what the future may look like for high performance computing and where it may be going. So this, this guest today is Greg Kurtzer, and you probably know Greg industry-wide, worldwide, guy who introduced us to operating systems, made life more efficient in high-performance computing around the world, uh, CentOS, Rocky Linux, and others. So today we're gonna ask Greg to give us some insight on the future of high-performance computing. So Greg, welcome to the show. How are you Hi, doing? Tony. I'm doing great, thank you so much. All right, so Greg, um, we're dealing with, you know, current architectures, Beowulf, all this stuff. You know, um, what what what's your opinion on this? And you know, is there a future for high performance computing? Well, I, I sure hope there's a future for it. Uh, <laughs> we have a lot of science and researchers that are absolutely dependent on it. So yeah, uh, but the, I think I think to your point, is the future the Beowulf? And I don't know. That's where my mind goes. Yeah. So, so, I mean, what do you, what are you thinking? Are we just going to continue to use this classic architecture or are things going to change or do, do they need to change? Well, great question. I mean, um, I think it's important to really recognize the Beowulf for what it's, what it's brought us in terms of technology, first and foremost, um, almost 30 years old. And it has been the architecture that we have relied on for scientific computing for, I mean, pretty much every system in the top 500 and every HPC cluster that we use worldwide. So it, it's been just phenomenal and massively effective at, at driving science. Uh, but it's also been a fairly stagnant architecture that we've been using for 30 yeah. years now. So what yeah. comes next? Yeah. Hey, could you, could you, could you um, explain a little bit what Beowulf is maybe at a high level for some of our guests who maybe just being introduced to high performance computing? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in the early 90s, and maybe even a little bit before that, pretty much every big system that we leveraged was 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 big iron, basically. It was, it was uh, not commodity. It was specifically built, specifically designed resources, uh, extremely expensive, very high barrier to entry. And in, again, the early 90s, uh, Thomas Sterling and uh, Donald Becker uh, started thinking about how can we use Linux and freely available software and commodity hardware to create supercomputers. And, and, and that was the beginning of the Beowulf. Uh, they, they architected a, a solution that used, you can think of it almost as a, uh, a single system or, or a, a head node or head resource that users would log into via something like Secure Shell, SSH. And from there, they would be able to leverage, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the storage systems, resource managers sch or schedulers, um, leverage MPI message passing or some other form of parallelization libraries and easily be able then to, to scale up their resources. And then there's a lot of compute nodes that are behind this kind of top heavy, uh, this, this big, you know, node up, up at front, right? We'll call it the control node, right? right, right? Then right. you've got all these, these compute nodes behind it. And again, the compute nodes are mounting up that, those storage systems. So everything looks and feels the same, no matter where you are within this giant monolithic resource. Uh, and once you're into that, again, you're interacting with the scheduler, the resource manager to, to run your jobs across this, this architecture. Uh, that's the, the general gist of the Beowulf. And it's been that way for again, I mean, decades and systems today, uh, have, have really just kind of optimized and leveraged that same basic architecture. Right. Right. Now also the software also had to change a little bit to adapt to a parallel architecture or a cluster architecture. Right. And then can you talk a little bit about that? So 
when we and I think what you're asking is is really about the message passing and and parallelization. Right. So a lot of questions that um, I used to field, even from researchers, is I'm running this this piece of software on my laptop or on my desktop, and now I want to go bring it to a big HPC system. Can I all of a sudden run it on a on a thousand nodes? And the answer to that is, well, not really. You have to have software and applications that's been designed and developed. Uh, to run across many different systems. So first off, you have to figure out how to break apart your algorithm. Once you've broken apart your algorithm into pieces, n number of pieces, because n may be different on one cluster than it is on another, uh, you then have to figure out, well, how are you going to do inter-process communication? How are you going to manage uh, the, the affinity of processes on one computer versus affinity of processes on another computer? And how are you gonna pull all this together? And to do that, the message passing interface uh, specification was created and we've used this interface or the specification uh, MPI now for, again, for a long time to take applications that might be really effective at running serially, meaning on a, on a single thread or a single process and, and now be able to scale that up to where we can run it on uh, hundreds or even thousands of nodes. Right. And theoretically running it on a thousand nodes, it completes a thousand times faster than with just one note, theoretically. Theor theoretically. The theoretically, right. <laughs> right. right. So, uh, yeah. Of course, many apps do not do that. But um, yeah, the theory is we wish everything would scale linearly, meaning if you double the amount of processors you're running on a particular algorithm, it doubles its performance. Um, it, as, as you know, Tony, it, it doesn't always work that way. As a right, matter of fact, right. um, and, and it gets worse as you scale bigger typically. So um, how to do that process, inner process communication, especially uh, in between nodes is so critical. And there's been so much research and, um, and, and hardware and optimizations that we've been leveraging to do that. Yeah. Okay. That's a great background. So now I'd like to move to a little bit different, move ahead a little bit. Could you tell us a little bit about your journey from CentOS to now? <laughs> from CentOS? Um, Oh my gosh, you made me say it wrong. <laughs> Centos. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, yeah, no, no, no. I, I got it's, that. It's funny. I, I used to have such a thing about this. Um, when, when, when Lance first proposed the name to me, uh, Centos, uh, it was, you were all working in IRC. So I, I saw it typed and I said, you know, I really, I really like this name, but you know, I got to say, I, I don't like, you know, having the OS kind of separate from Cent because it puts emphasis on the scent part, which yeah, right, you know, most right. of us think scent being free, or excuse me, um, not free. It's small, but not free. And, um, you know, CentOS is free, so uh, I didn't like it. Uh, but, of course, you know, I used to make a big deal about it. But then I grew up and uh, got a little bit more mature. But very rarely do I ever say CentOS, but just I mirrored you on that. So <laughs> you got me. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, what, what, so I go back to, let's go back to the question. I think it was, um, oh, just, how, just, yeah, how, post CentOS, yeah. post CentOS. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so how did you get to where you are now? That's what, well, first the earth cooled and then the dinosaurs came. Sorry. Okay. Uh, quote right. from the movie right. airplane. If anyone, was, if anyone got that quote, awesome points for you. Um, how did we get to where we are now? So, Let's see, I started life as a biochemist and really wanted to um, uh, move from doing wet labbing to more theory work and more genomics, et cetera. And that's where I started getting introduced into computers um, and, and specifically open source and Linux. And from there, moved into uh, high performance computing where I was able to help not only the, the, the biologists, but scientists at large, joined Department of Energy, uh, created a bunch of open source projects, Werewolf was the first, I think, big one that I created, big project. And, and, and what what was Werewolf for everybody? Uh, Werewolf was a cluster man, or is still alive. Werewolf is a cluster yeah. management uh, solution, uh, specifically at solving the problem of how do we scale the time of the system administrators and do operating system management and imaging for clusters uh, very efficiently. So. Uh, it came to be because I was our, I, I joined Berkeley lab. I was, I was asked to build some clusters and I'm like, I'd love to, but I'm kind of busy. Like I have a lot of other work I need to do. 
uh, you know, you're going to throw 100 or 200 more systems at me. Uh, that's a lot of work. So I wanted to figure out how to do it more effectively. And um, Werewolf was born from that. Uh, to this day, it's still uh, it's still alive and kicking and, and doing very well. And the project is um, one of the one of the foundation pieces of OpenHPC, among others. And uh, so so Werewolf is out there. So I created Werewolf in 2001. In 2002, 2003, I had an idea of um, creating an operating system that was community based, but RPM focused or RPM um, uh, built around the, the notion of RPM, the packaging format RPM. And um, that was originally called Chaos Linux. Um, from Chaos Linux, CentOS was born. Um, I led the project from inception to the point where um, we handed it off to, to another individual. I mentioned Lance Davis before. We handed it off to Lance Davis. And, um, uh, and Lance took the project and, and kept growing it. And, and then eventually, you know, Red Hat uh, acquired the, the, the project in 2014. And then they end of life the project in 2000. Yeah, right. It was more recent. Yeah. <laughs> Much more recent than 2000. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, and no, life to not that long ago old. that happened. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so then you did something else there, right? You built a little piece of container software, didn't you? Yeah, so that was, that's an interesting story as well. So um, in about... 2014, 2015, uh, containers were all the rage in enterprise and uh, Docker came to be and containers were taking over. Like on the enterprise side, I mean, you couldn't go to a conference, you couldn't go to a discussion and have somebody not bring up containers. It was just a matter of time before the notion of containers came into high performance computing and researchers and scientists started understanding how to use containers and how to leverage containers for their, for their research. And, and ease kind of the deployment and uh, reproducibility of their work. So of course, they started asking the HPC centers, would you be interested in, uh, or, or can you install Docker into HPC? Now, a couple of things to recognize about Docker specifically as an implementation, it was designed to run services as root, microservices, at least initially. This is the rub, go ahead, this is good. <laughs> and. Um, on an HPC platform, we may have, you know, I kind of described the base architecture of the Beowulf before. You may have, you know, tens or hundreds or even thousands of users logged into this research resource at any given point, and none of them should ever have root privilege or root capabilities on any of the compute resources, any of the nodes, or really anything even on that that network. And so, can you yeah. explain why that why that is for our, our viewers? Yeah, so the way that we typically do security and high-performance computing, and, and the Beowulf in general, again, we're leveraging POSIX security, which basically means we're using Unix security. So a user logs in as themselves, so they have a particular UID, and that UID is an unprivileged UID. They don't have access to make system changes. Uh, so when they log in, they can, they can operate as a user, but not as an administrator or as a super user. So... We rely on that, um, that facet for a lot of the internal security of an HPC system uh, quite dramatically. So everything from, from files to data to what, what can they edit, what can they change, what can they see, um, et cetera. So if we were to go and run a container system that by definition would allow them to escalate their privileges as part of that, and then run applications and run tools that could uh, very easily affect that host system, uh, that's a security breach in, in our mind. So we wanted, to, we wanted to implement containers, but the container system that everybody's been using and everybody's been working with would pose a security issue uh, in, a, in a traditional high-performance computing or Beowulf architecture. Uh, the problem of doing this was was very was felt very far and wide. Um, this became one of the major uh, conversation points within high performance computing and system administrators and centers everywhere is how the heck do we support containers? Uh, most people were thinking of it from how do we do it with Docker because that was the tool set that everybody was was familiar right. with in enterprise. I looked at it from a different perspective, which just is what problem are we really trying to solve? And the problem we're trying to solve is scientists and researchers have put these containers 
into Docker Hub or into you know a, a container repository or registry, and they want to run inside of that environment in an HPC system. Well, if you if you focus the problem on exactly what they're trying to solve, all of a sudden it's not so it's not so scary. And uh, so I created a system called Singularity that that did this, and it did it very very well. Um, within about six months of the first release of Singularity, uh, it was installed on pretty much 90% of every system worldwide, that HPC system worldwide that ran containers, which was a very large percentage of all HPC systems. So Singularity just took off and it massively um, just changed how scientists and researchers are thinking about applications. They're thinking about reproducibility and they're thinking about trust and security and supply chain. Singularity dramatically changed that entire landscape. Right. So, so the administrators can go, get some sleep at night, right? It's, it, as a matter of fact, on several reasons, because one is it, it increased the security um, uh, scope on the systems. Like it made systems and made applications more secure. Like system administrators wanted the users to run inside of containers because they couldn't do as much. It, it limited what they can do uh, more than it than it escalated what they can do. And so there's that, but there's also now the application side. We can now allow scientists and researchers to use containers to develop their own environments, their own application environments. So if a, if a scientist said, I need to run Debian or Ubuntu because my application already works on that, right. or a vendor said, you have to run on SUSE or Red Hat Enterprise Linux, or, or something else, or a particular version. Now, all of a sudden, with containers, we can we can meet those needs, and the system administrators and the user services consultants don't actually even have to do that. We can now put the onus of the containerization back on the researchers and scientists who actually wanted to do that. So it made life better for everybody. Yeah, That sounds yeah. like a cliche. <laughs> okay, so now let's fast forward to today, all right? And what... There, there's something fuzzy in the future here, and why don't we why don't we <laughs> talk a little bit about that? Because I, I think this is a very interesting uh, uh, topic for our our viewers to see and understand about maybe the, a little glimpse of what the future about high performance computing is. So this is this is this is another funny story. Um, so. Being kind of on the fence between a traditional HPC mindset uh, and now seeing what the enterprise clouds and hyperscalers are doing, um, honestly, just put me in a completely different vantage point. Now, for, at least from where I was before. Where I was before was I did traditional high-performance computing, I did the Beowulf, and everything can be solved with that architecture and what enterprise and cloud and hyperscalers are doing has nothing to do with what we're doing. We're doing this and we're great at it. We know how to do it and it's proven. We don't need to, we don't need to bother ourselves with that. And, and this, this came across in many different facets, including cloud. Like, uh, I, I can't, you know, my management for, for decade and a half kept saying, you know, we have to figure out how to run HPC and leverage cloud. No, we don't. <laughs> this works just fine. We don't need to do that. And, um, and so it was always a discussion. It was always an argument. But part of that really had to do with this base architecture. And it's because this is how we build these systems. This is how we know how to build these systems. And, and they work. Like, why would we ever think about it differently? And, and, and they're very efficient, right? And they can provide very, very, very good return on investment for an on-premise system. Oh, thousand percent, thousand percent. And then I had an interesting meeting. Um, I was brought into a big um, a social media company and um, they're big hyperscalers. Not going to name it. You can probably guess. And uh, they brought me in and the conversation kind of went like, Greg, we're going to build the biggest HPC system in the world. And my response to that was, wow, okay. Like, what are you thinking? What, what are you going to build? And they described to me an architecture that, that honestly I've never considered because I'm coming at this from a traditional HPC perspective. They're coming at it from a, a hyperscaler perspective. And I'm hearing the architecture that they want to build. And my immediately my mind is just like, no, like, don't do that. Like that, that's horrible. Don't why would you ever do that? And then we kept digging. Like, 
Where's your data? Well, it's all over the world. Why is it all over the world? Well, because we have exabytes and we have to shard it and put it everywhere because it, it is everywhere. It's like, okay, yeah. so. Well, I mean, gravity it, pulls, right? Gravity yeah. pulls. Yeah. And, and all of a sudden it started to, it started to um, click and dawn on me that this traditional Beowulf actually can't do what they want to do. And, um, and it's not until we kind of unite and cross pollinate between, you know, HPC and what we've been doing with HPC and taking the best aspects of HPC and then start to unite that towards enterprise technology and cloud and hyperscaler technology and now start to really just pull these all together into, into a new, a new type of platform. And, and that was the creation of, uh, of fuzzball and fuzzball is, we, we jokingly call it HPC 2.0 because it really is an entirely new way of thinking about high performance computing from an architecture perspective. Um, it can still do, tightly coupled tr um, traditional simulation modeling and all the stuff that we do in high performance computing today you can still do all of that. The interfaces are different. Uh, you never SSH into the system. Everything is over APIs. And as a result, you can have CLIs, you know, command line interfaces for, for interacting with the system, but you can also have graphical environments, uh, web-based environments. One of my team members constantly jokes and says, I want to get to the point where I can program and submit and monitor HPC jobs from my flip phone. And that is actually where we want to be able to take this. And as long as we have the right APIs, we can do it. You, you, you issue flip phones for your employees at work? <laughs> um, Greg, we have, we have more modern phones now. With, <laughs> just to let you know, you might want to look at the technology. So the phones, um, the, the phones are funny, actually, these flip, new flip phones, because the screen opens up and you can't even see the seam anymore. But there's an interesting point. I, I gave a, a talk recently and um, I, I decided to do some research and to figure out, you know, at what at what point, how powerful are our t cell phones today in comparison with supercomputers of the past? And um, many people may remember ASCII Red which was the first system to beat the teraflop barrier. Well, our cell phones now are well over two teraflops. <laughs> that system cost $44 million to build. And that was in the mid nineties. So wow. not even that long ago, but we've got more computing power now in our phones. Well, Moore's law, right? So. Indeed, indeed. But, and we don't have a Beowulf in our phones. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably not. So. But okay, so uh, outside of the flip phones and the regular phones, so the uh, so what's tell us more about fuzzball and the architecture and why why it's so good and why it's two HPC two dot So when I was first hearing about this architecture and the the, the problem that this this social media company was trying to solve. Um, it, it did become clear to me that this, this can't be done today. And there's, and I drafted out all the reasons. And if anyone's interested, just hit me up. Like I've got lists of reasons at this point. And um, I've debated them with people. We've talked them over with people. And almost every single time what we've decided is we really need a better architecture. It's not that, again, it's not that the Beowulf is not a great architecture, but it's, it's quite legacy at this point. It's a little long in the tooth. And it, it's not just because we need new interfaces. Um, or, or we need them to, to, to deal with a more modern environment. It's because our, our workflows are changing and the types of science and the types of ways that we're approaching science is changing. It's growing. It's becoming more diverse. It's becoming, uh, you know, v much wider. We used to call this the long tail of science, which was, you know, the, the, the main kind of bell curve of science was all of those tightly coupled traditional HPC MPI programs and, and that was what we built these giant systems for. But now what we're seeing is, you know, this long tail of other types of other types of computational work is, is now actually starting to become the majority. It's no longer the minority. Um, and, and again, the, the traditional MPI applications are still super important. They're always going to be super important. So whatever we build, we have to continue to support that. But we now also have to support an entire new kind of diversity of workflows and 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 jobs. And, and we have to continue lowering the barrier for new scientists and new researchers. Uh, yes, it's, it's that's very important. important. Yeah. yeah. I used yeah. to be asked, 
so I, I was joined appointment to UC Berkeley and I used to be asked by researchers, you know, from a computational side, what's the, where should I be thinking about learning and whatnot? It's like, oh, you got to learn Linux. You got to learn Unix and, and how to use an operating system properly. And, and now you have to learn programming and you have to learn all these other things. You're like, but that has nothing to do with my science, right? I want to focus on science, right? This is, this is my area that I'm, I, I've been training for so long. Now you're telling me I have to go take an intro course on Linux and, what we really need to do to move forward is to start um, increasing that, um, or I should rather decreasing the barrier to entry. And we're already seeing this happen, right? Jupyter Hub and Jupyter Notebooks is a prime example of this. And we're seeing Jupyter Notebooks even, you know, you know, many years ago at this point, um, have been considered one of the standard ways of classroom teaching. So everybody just gets access to a notebook and, and they're interfacing with a very interactive kind of development environment um, through Jupyter. Uh, that just really demonstrates, you know, things are changing. And if we in high performance computing aren't embracing some of these changes and, and moving forward with it, quite honestly, we're going to be left behind. And that, that's, you know, I, I spent so many years in high performance computing and supporting science. I don't want to be left behind. I don't want the science to suffer because we couldn't embrace new technologies and new ideas and new ways of thinking. We have to be looking forward. We have to be figuring out how do we become more effective over time? How do we become um, uh, smarter by lowering the barrier to entry, by creating systems that have better interfaces and, um, and are more efficient and more capable in terms of using additional resources? So... Um, cloud is an example of that. So what does fuzzball do for me as a researcher? What is it, what is it, how does it enable and how is it, it, I think it's a little disruptive too. So what is it, what does it do? I mean, what does it tie together? How does it tie together resources and how does it make it easier for people to use so, HPC? To answer that, I'm going to, I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, the user, a basic user environment or a, a, a user manual for an HPC system, right? You start off, you, you SSH into the system. Once you're there, you, you, you look at what the system looks like. You look at your compilers. You, 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 you go download your source code. You figure out how to compile your source code, usually modifying make files to figure out how to compile the source code properly for that environment. Um, taking into consideration, you know, whether it's GPUs, whether it's uh, what kind of interconnect you have, what kind of environment, what kind of MPI. So you have to now build your applications. You have to then download your, your data that you want to test, um, put it to the right storage systems, make sure everything's landing in the right place, and then figure out well, all the queues on the resource manager that are, you're allowed to, to submit to. Submit to the right queues, wait around for a while, see if, it, see if it, the job runs successfully. And if it does... You then look to see if your data looks good. And if it does, you're copying your data now off of the system to go do something else with it. I'm that's, tired, Greg. I'm <laughs> tired after that. <laughs> that's what we've been doing for 30 plus years. Right, right, right. That's, I mean, every researcher, every person who comes into a high performance computing system, that's what they do. So what, we're, what we thought about with Fuzzball is how do we completely change this? How do we lower that to anybody can do this? So... We started off with, well, let's dump SSH, right? Let's, let's go everything over APIs. Now let's put interfaces in front of these APIs that can lower the barrier so far to the point where somebody's logging in via a website or, or you know, using, using a credential from you know, OAuth or, or OpenID or whatever, right? So they, have, they, they log in. Once they're logged in, they can go either develop a workflow or use a pre-existing template workflow that somebody else already created, modify that, or just fill in the templates, like fill in the input data, the output data, and what do you want to do for your science, and then go just hit submit. And it automatically does the ingress of your data, dealing with volumes, dealing with all of the containers that you need, all of the data, dealing with the MPI, does yeah. everything automatically, and so from a user perspective, you log in, you submit your workflow, it does the ingress, and the only thing you have to deal with is, well, now the egress goes somewhere. And, then, and, that, and this is true no matter where the resources are. Is it, yes. is, it true that, is it true that the resources are kind of transparent to the user? Is that, is that correct? Yes. The, the workflow is defined 
in a DSL. Um, and that DSL is an acyclic graph that basically says, you know, here's my starting point and I, I can have a workflow that's just, you know, kind of one, one job after the next, or I can have jobs that branch off, do diamond patterns, come back together or just tree and whatnot. And at the end of it all, the system will automatically, again, egress your data back out of it. So in the DSL, you can specify the containers, you can specify um, the architectures, the microarchitectures, if you need GPUs, if you want InfiniBand, um, all of these different types of things. Eventually, we want to get to the point where we're just querying the container. So when we see the container, we can say, ah, what's inside that container? Let's make sure we're matching that up properly with the hardware. So if that container right. is optimized for a GPU, let's make sure we're, we're landing it on the proper GPU. And that, um, and that container is a singularity container, right? It, it could be. Uh, it could be singularity, obtainer container, but it can also be just a standard Docker or OCI container. Yeah. It is completely neutral with, with regards to whatever kind of containers you want to run. All right. Wow. Making HPC easier to use and enabling more research and facilitating it. That's a pretty good story, Greg. So and then I guess cloud. Oh, sorry, yeah. Tony, didn't interrupt, but cloud pieces, this Ooh. is huge. All right. So let's hear a little bit on the cloud. You got you got something to say on that? Yeah, so I feel as though, and people are free to argue with this if you wish, but I feel as though one of the barriers to limitations in terms of HPC running in the cloud is our existing architecture. There's a few different ways that we've approached it. Uh, one of which is, um, you know, we've, we've built Beowulfs in the cloud. Like we'll actually go get a bunch of instances and we go and literally build right, that right. Beowulf. You just in map the cloud. it up. Right. Right. Yeah. Which which definitely works, but then you're still doing all of that SSH compiling, you know, checking, you know, storage system management, data management, what you're just now doing it in a cloud system instead of a physical system. Like nothing's really changed uh, aside from that. Um, there's also ways that we've integrated cloud with with resource managers. Like resource managers on an on-prem system can say, well, when we need burst capabilities, we can go spin up resources up in the cloud and we'll go run it there. Yeah, that 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 works in theory pretty well. Um, but in reality, there's very few workloads that you're going to want to run in the cloud from your on-prem system because we're not taking into consideration of data. And when we start looking at data, what we actually find is, and you said this before, gravity is massive. I didn't mean a pun there, but but it is like if you've got a lot of data, you want the jobs and workflows to go to that data. You don't want to move that data to another system. So really what this becomes is we have to be thinking about this from a federated space. And if we have data that's on prem, we want the workflows to kind of have an affinity to go run on prem. But if we've got data already up in the cloud or if the data data does not have much gravity and the data security policy allows for that job to run up in the cloud, well, maybe it makes sense to run it up in the cloud. Now it's really a resource and cost question. Do we want to run it in the cloud? And, and that's, that's another whole facet of what we've been building into Fuzzball to not only create clusters, but to manage clusters of clusters and to do orchestration and meta orchestration um, of right. all of these sorts of workflows. Boy, this is great. Now, for the, the viewers watching the show, um, how do they get more information from you on or from what you're doing about a fuzzball? Well, the easiest way, go to our over to our website. We've got some information over there. It's CIQ.com. And from there, you can also contact us, reach out to us. Um, you're going to see more news coming on fuzzball here very shortly. And um, yeah, we're happy to show it to you. We're happy to demo it. We're happy to give you access to it. Just let us know. All right. Well, Greg, thank you very much for sharing the future of high performance computing 2.0 with us today. Really appreciate it. Uh, that was Tony, a fantastic uh, journey you gave us and everything. Really enjoyed it. Tony, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And thank you all for viewing HPC Tech Talks today. Uh, if you like the show and like to see more, please click and subscribe and we'll give you updates on future shows. We've got a lot of stuff planned and a lot of interesting interviews coming. So thank you very much for viewing us today and hope to see you soon. <laughs>